Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here. We're here on research at UH Manoa. We're talking about gender difference in, differences in mice. Uh, that's really a very hokey way of putting it. Um, with impaired sel selenium. Still, still accurate, I still have it, okay. And that's next to me is Marla Berry. Uh, she is the a professor at the uh, John, uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine and chair of the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology. Am I right? Okay. Correct. Okay, and then next to her is uh, Lucia Seal, who's a junior researcher, and next to Lucia is Matt Pitts, and he's an assistant researcher. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming down. My pleasure. So uh, we're going to first, you know, i got to say, M Marla and I go back. We were children together. <laughs> In, in, the, uh, in the days of uh, Camelot, <laughs> the Cadmanian days at the medical school, yep. when I interviewed her for Hawaii Public Radio, and I, we did stuff, yep. and it was great. And you were one of uh, his recruits, I remember, his original recruits, which made you, you know, a person who could, like, walk on water and all that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so what's happened since then? Can you give us an update on your department and, and your life in science? Sure. So, uh, so my lab studies selenium, and selenium is a trace element that we get in our diet, and it's um, incorporated into proteins, which are called selenoproteins, not surprisingly. <laughs> and selenium is best known uh, as a dietary nutrient that is involved in antioxidant protection, so protecting us from um, basically the, the rigors of daily living that generate oxidative stress. Uh, so selenium is present in these enzymes that... So this is about antioxidants? Some of kind it. Of, kind some of, of it's yeah, about okay, antioxidants. Right, okay. We don't really know everything that selenium does. And basically, it, it, it appears that it does everything. It's important for, um, as I mentioned, antioxidant defense and protection. Hope you're making it's notes. Make notes. It's yeah. important in, um, <laughs> in protection from neurological damage and diseases, which we talked about when I was on the show before. Um, it's important for male fertility. Um, it's important in thyroid hormone metabolism. There are implications for cancer. Um, and there are probably a host of other things. And Lucille will tell you a little bit about um, what she found out, which was very surprising and unexpected. Okay. Um, it's role in, in metabolism. Okay, so it's fair to say that you've been spending a lot of time in this subject. It's fair to say. I think I got that, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Lucille, what have you been doing in the subject? So I've been studying the way selenium is metabolized in our bodies and what we found out uh, recently is that when uh, our mice are not able to recycle selenium uh, properly in, in, uh, in their cells, what happens is that they become obese and they develop metabolic syndrome and they, uh, if selenium, we don't give them selenium, proper amounts of selenium in their diet, they get much more fat and this just you know, goes, goes into a diabetic. Mice that are diabetic. Yeah, into a diabetic function. But interestingly enough, this is only happens with the male mice. It doesn't happen with the females. So right now, that's what we are trying to figure out why uh, the females don't get fat when uh, they do not recycle properly selenium. Okay, it's a great place to, to be because you know that something's wrong and now you got to figure out why, yes. and you got to structure experiments. Yes. And how, what experiments you got cooking? So, the first experiment that we did was basically uh, decreasing the levels of selenium in their diets. So we would give a normal diet uh, to the animals with low amounts of selenium, uh, and then we moved to uh, giving them a high-fat diet, which is much, which mimics uh, the diet that we take on a daily basis. You take them right down <laughs> yeah. to McDonald's and feed exactly. them. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, in the past, people used to call uh, what is called a cafeteria diet, which basically is feeding cookies and <laughs> things French alike rice. to mice. <laughs> uh, but now uh, uh, we have, you know, proper chows that has have a lot of uh, lipids and uh, fat uh, in, their, in the palate, in the little palate, so the mice get a significant amount of uh, lipids without, you know, eating just cookies and drinking coke. So I can just see a mice eating coke. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> drinking coke. <laughs> okay. So okay, all right. So um, Matt, what do you do? I largely do neuroscience related research. 
on these mice. Neuroscience? Yeah. Neuroscience? We had a show a few days ago about neuroscience. Oh, really? But how it's going to change everything. Yeah. It's going to make, it's going to mind control, all that. All yeah. Coming. Do you do mind control on the mice? <laughs> No, no. You just do some simple... What do you do? Tell, tell us in your own. Well, so, I guess the background in it is I started studying uh, mice with... Um, they had an impairment in a protein involved in selenium transport that other people had studied and found that basically they had severe cognitive impairment and problems with neuromotor function. When you say transport, you mean getting it around the body? Getting it around so the body. So you can have the selenium, but you've got to deliver it or it doesn't really help you. And it seems imp particularly important for the brain and testes, this particular protein. So we actually, recently, we crossed these mice with the mice Lustia was studying that, were at, that become diabetic. So we had a dysfunction in the selenium transporter, but also in the recycling enzyme. And what we saw was a very dramatic gender-specific phenotype in that the males... Um, had, had seizures, had severe motor problems, um, had really impaired survival, whereas the females were, were hardly affected at all. And we think it might be due to the presence of testes because selenium is extremely important for male fertility, and this could be an additional organ that... that uses it. Uses it. And, and so it draws it away from other yeah. uses. Oh, how interesting. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I want to be logical in our discussion, but I have some burning questions to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so how much of this is relevant to the human condition? Say all of it? Probably all of it. Ooh, that's scary. <laughs> well, well, we have to add the, the caveat that these mice have genetic impairment. So it's not, there could be certain humans that have rare populations of humans, but for humans as a whole, usually they have this a functional selenium transporter and a functional selenium recycling enzyme. So, so it's, but it could be very important. It could be. So there, there have been studies on another um, component of making selenoproteins, another um, factor that's required to make selenoproteins, where it's been, the genetic defect has been identified in humans and it did result in male infertility. So um, certainly um, with uh, animal studies, it's been known for a long time that selenium deficiency results in male infertility. It results in damage to the sperm themselves from the basically not having the antioxidant properties of the selenoprotein, um, and also damage to the, to, the, to the structure of the sperm so that they actually kink and bend and, and can even break the, between the heads and tails, but also damage to the sperm DNA. So, um, so even if they... Resulting in what? Mutational results? Could result in mutations. If they didn't already have impaired fertility, yeah. you could also have problems with... Wow, with get you both ways. Yeah. So, um, this is oh, it's scary, but I mean, if I flip that on the other side, if I have adequate selenium, I'm not sure what that is, you'll have to tell me, and if I have good transport system, and it's getting where it has to go, and it's not being hijacked <laughs> anywhere, right. Right. then I'll be healthier. I mean, me. Mm -hmm. huh. So, but there is a, f a fine line, and actually Lucia is good at explaining this. Yeah. Uh, in the 90s, uh, clinical trials were done where they would feed, you know, give uh, to men uh, supplements of selenium. And when they uh, supplemented their normal diets, you know, their daily diets with uh, large amounts of selenium, what happened was that the risk of developing type 2 diabetes increased. So there is a fine line between being deficient in selenium and then uh, having problems with fertility and thyroid function and then having too much selenium and having problems with uh, metabolism of uh, carbohydrates and lipids. So this fine line is where we, should, we need to understand a little better the mechanisms that determine it. So, and, and I want to caution. Um, Oh, I, otherwise we just get run away with optimism. Right, here. exactly. Right. So exactly. there was a study that was published in the 90s about the possibility of selenium preventing cancer, and that's what led that to this my next subsequent question. study. Yeah. <laughs> um, most Americans get adequate selenium in their diet. We eat food from a variety what of sources. Where does it come from? It comes from all over the place. 
comes from the soil, gets from the soil into the plants, from the plants to the animals that graze on those plants. It's in the ocean, so if you eat seafood, if you eat vegetables, if you eat meat, any of those sources, you're it's probably getting adequate. It's on the periodic table of elements. Yes, yeah. yeah. elements. That's correct. Okay. So if you uh, eat a lot of pro highly processed foods and don't, in general, have a have a good diet might end up selenium deficient, but it's really not a problem in the U.S., although there are places in the world where it is. So there are regions where um, people subsist on locally grown crops and the soil is selenium deficient, and so the, those, there's you know, some regional selenium deficiency. Complete footnote, but did you see 60 Minutes last night? No. There's a no, very interesting study about uh, Huh? Actually, that was earlier. I didn't hear you. Never. <laughs> I was watching the Patriots game last night. Well, okay, I used to live in Boston. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was about uh, about drugs. It was about these drugs that can do remarkable things here in the U.S. And these drugs are very expensive. Even even as a copay, they're very expensive. I mean, really expensive. In fact, um, uh, the guy from uh, HMSA uh, was talking about them in one of our recent programs. And uh, you know, mentioned that you know you could have a, a drug that a regimen of this drug to save your life. And it was true in the case of uh, hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. um, Hilton Rathel was the guy, okay. um, number two, I think, in HMSA. You, you could spend you know, what is it, three hundred thousand dollars a year on this drug, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of money. If you and if you tally everybody up with hepatitis C. You could cure them all, but mm -hmm. it would, that the money you spent on that drug would be as much as you spend on everything else. Now, what the interesting part, and I, this may or may not relate to anything you've said, but it's worth mentioning, is in 60 Minutes last night, they found that these very expensive drugs, patented drugs, made by U.S. pharma, okay, are more expensive in the U.S. than anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. You can get the identical drug anywhere outside the U.S. for a fraction of the cost. It costs, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month for this drug, but overseas it's a fraction of that. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with anything you said, though. Huh? Okay. Well, selenium, selenium actually, can I is, buy selenium? selenium is very cheap. You can go to CVS and That's buy it. That's the good news. That's yeah. the good news. <laughs> um, and you can buy it in different amounts, too. There is a you know, a lot of data on what, on how much selenium we need in our diets, and as I said, most of us get enough. But you can buy uh, a supplement that contains the recommended daily allowance, or twice that, or four times that. So what and about Lucia's what point, though, that you can have too much? Right. So, that's so what if they I gave go in down to the, the uh, nutrition store and I buy a mm -hmm. lot of this, thinking it's going to help me in every way, and then I tank up on selenium, I could be in trouble. Yep, you're better off just eating fruits and vegetables and seafood and a healthy diet. Okay, so how do you, in this context, how do you tell when it's healthy? How do you tell you're at the optimal level? For something like selenium? Mm -hmm. So there are easy blood tests for enzymes that are found in the red blood cells that are antioxidant enzymes. So we can do that. We can do that with people. We can do that with animals. Very easy. Okay, so I, I, I will know then... Well, if I eat my fresh vegetables, I'll be fine anyway, but I'll, I'll know then. And if I were a mouse, I'd know too. Uh, I'd know that I had too much or too little. You can find out. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we, what can we actually do from the research that you're doing? What, where, where, where does it take us you know, to say, for example, cure diabetes or control diabetes? Do you want to take that? I think <laughs> in mice or humans, I make no distinction. Oh, I can only talk about mice. Okay, you know, fair enough. But it's I can extrapolate to humans <laughs> a little bit. But I think uh, it will gauge the amount of supplements that someone can or cannot take or for uh, if the person has a condition already, like already pre-diabetic or a little overweight. You know what uh, should be the uh, adequate supplement or if they should never take supplements at all for selenium so this is uh, what the human implication we could see it's better guidelines for supplementation is it is it is it as simple as measuring selenium or does selenium interact with other things like in the transport system for example where you could actually 
find a combination of effects that will fix my diabetes or my mouse's diabetes, as the case may be. I mean, is it is it just selenium, or is it selenium connected? And if it's connected with something else, what is the something else? It's all interconnected. I mean, yes, really, you want to. I agree. You want to. You want to prevent <laughs> diabetes. The, you know, yeah. common sense is probably the the best way to go about it. Okay, but I want a pill. <laughs> I want a pill to fix it myself. I well, do not want to change my lifestyle. I want it fixed. There are all. there are yeah. drugs that that. People take for diet. I mean, not just insulin, but there are metformin, or you know, there are drugs that are prescribed. But they, you know, anytime you you you're putting something in to sort of change the the metabolic parameters and affect the enzymes in your body, you're at risk of secondary altering secondary effects. Yeah, altering other yeah. things. And statins have been shown to actually uh, affect the uh, seleno selenoprotein levels in uh, target tissues like the liver and skeletal muscles. So. Um, and it's a widely used drug. So we know it affects the selenium pathways in certain ways, but is that uh, helping or, you know, actually compounding to a later effect that could be damaging? So. Okay. So it sounds like in a general sense, you're just trying to find out everything you can find out about selenium and how it affects mice, especially female mice, male mice. Separately, Both. Both. Mm -hmm. Male and female. Okay, on that note, let's, t let's take a short break. Um, I'm here with Marla Berry, Ph.D., uh, and uh, Lucia Seal, Ph.D., um, and uh, Matt Pitts, Ph.D., all at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, all working um, under Marla, who is the chair of the uh, Department of uh, Cell and Molecular Biology there, and uh, working about, uh, working on... Um, on, let's see, gender difference in mice uh, with impaired selenium. We are going to get to the bottom of this. Sounds good. <laughs> right after this break. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do, and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're, uh, we're talking about research at UH Manoa, and since technically UH Manoa includes uh, Kaka'ako in the medical school, you guys are within the, uh, the ambit of our show today. <laughs> With Marla Berry, uh, Lucia Seal, and Matt Pitts all, all working on uh, on uh, gender differences in mice. You wanted to say something more about the gender differences, Matt? The gender differences? Yeah. Um, well, the only thing I was going to add is that we're we're trying to study both both of them. So we're not we're not focusing on on, on the female mice. That's not the object of the study. It's just to try and get more insight into both genders because particularly with selenium the testes seems to be something that hasn't really been accounted for in a lot of the studies that have been done to date and could actually have implications for different recommended daily allowances between males and females. How did you get into this anyway? How did I get into this? Yeah. Um, I did, I worked in another laboratory for my PhD at UH Manila with um, somebody named Lori, Lori Takahashi. And after that, I moved. I wanted to stay in Hawaii, and Marla's lab was one, pretty much the only place I had the opportunity to, to continue neuroscience research. So that's your, your field is neuroscience research. Yeah. How about you, Lucia? How did you get into it? Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> we have time. But, okay. <laughs> so I think I've been always passionate about hormones and endocrinology. And uh, in the beginning, I was studying thyroid hormone. So I had an opportunity to go uh, to Boston to finish my uh, master's stu studies there. What school? Uh, Harvard Medical mm -hmm. School. Uh, with uh, 
with a, in a lab that was doing thyroid research, which was also Marla's uh, neighbor lab, sort of. So she saw me working there and kind of invited uh, me to join her group. And since then, I've been with her. <laughs> there was a little break in the middle, but. <laughs> Marla, how did you get into this? Um, sort of accidentally. So as really? Lucia said, I was a, a, I was a postdoc in, in Boston studying thyroid hormone metabolism. Harvard Medical School. At Harvard. Um, because of something in common, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, it was really by accident that we figured out that selenium was involved in thyroid hormone metabolism. And my boss at the time was an MD who was very interested in thyroid hormone and didn't really, wasn't, wasn't that interested in selenium. And so I had a great opportunity, which not a lot of people have, to stay in the same place in a great environment, but to really carve out my own niche and not compete with my boss. So I basically had the field pretty much to myself for a little while, and it was interesting and exciting, and I stayed on for a long time, although I hadn't intended to stay in Boston that long. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't a cold weather person. <laughs> but, uh, and that note, I have to say the are. same. <laughs> she came with me to Hawaii. <laughs> as soon okay. as she heard I was coming to Hawaii, sign me up, I'll go. So, and, and since then, it basically the lab has followed the directions of the people that have come through the lab. So we've had, I had an immunologist come in a few years ago, and he carved out a selenium immunology project. I had a couple of neuroscientists come in, and we started pursuing, as I said, selenium's involved in everything. Isn't that the way it works, though? It's, yeah? You know, you, you're in an area, and, and there's sort of like, like, may I say, pseudopods, <laughs> right? And, and you, you bring in researchers, and they're into this area, that area. It's related, but it's not... Exactly right. in the main body of the super, and they take you in another direction, and you learn more in that, or this, or that. Oh, I've learned so much from the pe so much more from the people working in the lab than they learn from me. It's well, continually that's great. exciting, that's great. continually that's moving in new directions. Joy of modern education and, uh, is and like it, that, and it broadens the base of funding because you can apply for funding for so many different things. I want to talk to you about this. So this was the thing about the, the mice gender and all that. This is a this is a, a from the uh, Na National right. Institute of Health right. and. Um, how do you get a grant like this, and how big is it, and what is, what, what's the scope of it? So um, what happened was there was a funding announcement, a funding opportunity announcement, which is basically they say, we have money that we're going to target to a specific area. And this specific area came about because of studies over a considerable period of time showing that um, in clinical research and in basic research in the laboratories, that there was a, a strong bias towards men in, in the clinical studies uh, particularly the cardiovascular studies, uh, and there was also a, a strong um, preference for using male mice and, and, and male-derived cell lines in laboratories. And so the Why? male mice Why? is because they don't have the hormonal fluctuations that female mice do, okay. and so it just made the studies more Easier. simple, yeah. less variability, <laughs> just okay. completely throw out you know, half the, the population. It's like a blind eye somehow. So it turns out that, that in animal studies, it's about a five to one ratio of using of studies that use male mice versus studies that use both genders. And in clinical studies in cardiovascular disease, it's about three to one um, studies that involve men versus women. Overall, there's a, about an equal number of studies focusing on men versus women, but that's strongly biased by the fact that there have been so many studies on breast cancer. But if you look at everything else combined, it's, it's a lot of other things, still, yeah. So the NIH came up with this with this plan to, to provide $10 million in funding for gender-based, uh, both basic and clinical studies. And so they um, announced this funding opportunity. I submitted the application back in February, and we found out in September that uh, my lab is one of 80 labs that's being funded by this On the issue of male versus female gender and mice. Gender Gender um, it's not just mice. It's also any laboratory also animal no, or patients. It's also patient-oriented research. Okay, and it's so not it's limited to selenium. No, no, no. It's anything that will that will promote more gender equity in terms of research studies, yeah. not in terms of women in the labs or that kind of thing. That's in that's the, a whole other issue. We process. Could say. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask you about that. <laughs> this isn't about well, women's rights, is it? <laughs> well, it's about women's pa women patients' rights. Okay, in yeah, okay, okay. But this, you know, it's, am I right about this? It seems to me that this is going to teach you more about the, 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 the disparity in chemistry 
between the genders. Sure. Things Absolutely. you didn't know, things that come accidentally, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of you just find them because you're making the distinction and yep. doing the differential research. How exciting. It is. You know, viva la difference. We don't even know what it is yet, but viva la difference. <laughs> Absolutely. So what's the laboratory like that you have? I, I think I saw it, but it was a long time ago. I can't remember. If, uh, maybe it was when we were up in Manoa before we moved. Maybe so, yeah. So, but, um, you know, I mean, see, this, this studio, mm -hmm. got equipment. We love the equipment. We, we struggle and strain to find money to buy the equipment. Mm -hmm. We protect the equipment with our lives, you know. And I imagine it's not too different in a laboratory right. like yours. Right. So, um, so we're in the, the research building that uh, um, was opened up in Kakaako in 2005. And uh, my lab is, is in with a group of other researchers in the cell and molecular biology department. But we also have uh, some additional facilities that, um, that have essentially been generated by the work of people like Matt and some of his colleagues. So downstairs in the, um, oh, I'm not supposed to say where it is, <laughs> where the animals are, okay. um, there's, a, um, there's a, a facility that they've set up to, to study basically neuroscience in mice. And I'd rather let Matt talk about yeah. some of the tests that they do. How do you study neuroscience in, in mice? So behaviorally, we have a number of different tests that we run. Um, we assess motor function. We have this apparatus called a rotor rod that just spins and gradually spins faster, and the mice try and stay on it. And you pretty much measure how long they can stay on until they fall off. So that's one way. We have some um, mazes to assess cognitive function, um, usually um, we have one called the Morris Water Maze where you fill up a big tub with water and you put a, a platform just right beneath the w level of the water and they have all these spatial cues around the water maze and the mice, you release the mice in the water and they swim around and you keep doing it re repeatedly and gradually they get faster and they learn the spatial location. So that's it's a widely used test that we do but also labs all over the world do as well. You know, they have another test where they, they put the mice on an ink pad and ink their feet yeah. and then let them walk down a piece of paper and, yeah. and, and their footprints um, indicate what their gait is and whether sure. they have motor function differences. And so one of, one of the interesting things about the gait is it's been shown that when we knock out this gene for this linear transporter that they get this characteristic waddle, waddle gait and, it, and they have impaired neur neuromotor function. And actually, in what Marla mentioned earlier, in that the cases of rare patients that have um, impaired sleep people the patients, yeah. they actually have seen this waddling gait. The same gait. kind of difference in gait. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, it's it actually it's a waddle in each case. Yeah, there, there's only a few cases of humans that have been been found to have, have this mutation, but the the phenotype or the what the human looks like is pretty close to what the what the mouse looks like. This could be a great movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, they might have made it already with the people changing into mice and vice versa. <laughs> <clears throat> so, what does your laboratory look like? <clears throat> I mean, if you had the uh, <clears throat> this equipment and the the, the uh, ink pad and all that, I mean, is it a well, big place, a little place? They featured it on Lost. We had a little 30 second oh, blur great. that they but filmed NCIS in our lab. Yeah, <laughs> a few years back. <laughs> well, we we have some space, a small amount of space um, to do behavioral tests. And then upstairs we have a, a number of um, benches for a wet lab space where you can run your standard molecular biology techniques, which are, which we also do, do quite a bit. What is that? Is that where you take the mouse apart? Uh, it can be. I mean, yeah. it's basically looking at, looking at protein, running Western blots to look at protein levels. Um, and enzyme assays. Enzyme and assays, if you, you can get the, the, the yeah. serum and, and blood to, to check, like, for instance. Uh, but everything you do is going to be neuroscience. Is that right? Not necessarily. Okay. I mean, it's largely neuroscience, but there, there is some overlap. And there are, particularly with regards to something like, like obesity and diabetes, there, there is some overlap between the neuro component and what's going on in the rest of the body. Chemical. Yeah. Where it's it's a lot of it's endocrinology, which is yeah. can be influenced by the hypothalamus in the brain, but also the pituitary, the thyroid. So there's a lot of things that interact 
they can influence. When you when you do these experiments with the mice, do you see them as like little people? <laughs> Um, you know, because what, what goes on with them is something you can translate into real people? Not really, because sometimes for each study to be significant, you've got you've to repeat it, have a number of animals show that. So there's a lot more variability in there's humans. There's a, a lot of variability, so you get one the mice, result. The mice are genetically identical. So. Oh, are they? Mm -hmm. How do you get genetically identical? Well, you don't them. answer that because we're going to take a break. I want everybody to hang on that question. How do you get genetically identical mice? We're going to find out here on um, research at UH Manoa with Marla Berry, Lucia Seal, and Matt Pitts of the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at uh, the John A. Burns School of Medicine. We're going to find out right after this break. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. I host the Think Tech Hawaii Biz Ed Spotlight. We talk about fascinating people and interesting, pe interesting issues that affect our island state here in Hawaii. We broadcast every Thursday from 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 and on Olelo 54. Make sure you tune in and we'll see you soon. Aloha. We're back. We're live. And in case you were wondering, uh, we're going to discuss how to get identical mice in the laboratory at the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at Japsom, and Matt Pitts was about to tell us how to do that. Well, the, the mice my, my strains that we use are inbred, so there could be some subtle genetic differences, but more or less they're the same. And usually, pretty much for the test that we're doing, we're comparing one inbred strain where a selenoprotein is dysfunctional, another where that has a, another strain that has normal normal copies of all selenoproteins. So, so that's the only genetic difference. Yeah, so that oh, in theory the, should be the only for. genetic difference. Okay, and you're, you're breeding the mice in order to, in order to get the, 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 the same trait. Yeah, the I mice. personally don't do the breeding, but we, <laughs> okay. uh, we, we have somebody that helps with the breeding. Okay, so, all right, that, that's my answer. Lucia, what is your laboratory like? When you get up in the morning and go to work, what, what, what it's what pretty like? much the same, except that we uh, I don't perform behavior tests. Um, I usually measure more endocrine-related uh, parameters. Uh, I do a lot of assays for hormone uh, hormone circulating levels of insulin. Uh, I test for glucose response um, of these animals to see if they are developing diabetes or what stage of the, the metabolic syndrome development they are. Um, sometimes we challenge them with insulin levels, which is a situation that we see in humans when they overload with insulin. For example, type 1 diabetics, they can have a tipping point with insulin that they uh, inject on themselves. So we, we do that in a very controlled way to uh, test how the animal is responding, how the animal, uh, their glucose level, are, are they okay or they're not? So you take blood tests? Yeah, a lot of blood out. tests. And I do a lot of molecular work too. And we use uh, cell lines for certain organs that are hard to access, like pancreas and liver that, you know, in the mice would require us to open and uh, see. So um, the mechanistic studies for the pathways that we are interested we look into cell lines that are closely related. Uh, it's an even more sterile environment to understand uh, mm -hmm. the selenium metabolism. <clears throat> but when you go into work, when you get you know, on that laboratory bench, how do you know what you're going to do in a given day? Is there a oh. schedule? Is there a little loose leaf book There's that tells you? There's a huge to-do list. A to-do list, <laughs> yeah. that's what it is? Okay, tell us about how that gets created. Uh, it, well, it starts with the funding, with the funding that you uh, where do you get the money to study? And then you uh, go over the experiments that, okay, we have this question. How do we answer this question in a proper way? Uh, is this always happening or is there are conditions? So it's, it's, it's we. a team. It's, it's, it's a team thing. Yeah, science is always a team. And, and, you, and you meet with everybody in the department or in the team anyway? Well, mainly with Marla's group and, you know, some students, the technicians involved. In, uh, and they say, Lucia, what are you doing today? And you tell them? It's not on a daily routine. We sat, like, uh, for a week, for example. This is important, yeah. No, for example, a weekly, we have weekly meetings where we yeah. set our goals, you know, uh, okay, 
or we suggest each other like oh like Matt you should maybe you should look into this and Matt will tell the same to me like oh did you measure this or that protein yeah, to yeah. analyze and so this is something that uh, it's done I would say in a weekly basis but any time that we have uh, uh, new results a new results or new challenges we get together and so do you yeah, write that through. somewhere yes yes well, where do you write it down on the computer nowadays I used to write all this down in notebooks but now it's all computers <laughs> So, so, you're they, so they all share. So they we get together and they all share their data from whatever experiments they've done recently, and we try and figure out what to what to do next. We also have some outside collaborations. There are some things that we oh, don't have correct. the ability to do here. So um, we're collaborating with some folks at Vanderbilt in in Nashville, and with the um, the lab that that Lucia and I were both in, the endocrine thyroid lab in Boston. So a couple years ago. Lucia and another student and I went back there for a conference, and they spent about a week in the lab learning how to do thyroid hormone assays. Certain kinds of tests. Yes. And then oh, they so you both. Go, you go to another lab to learn how they do it. Absolutely. Then you bring it back. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then Lucia and my other student, Christy, presented some of their work at the endocrine meeting there in Boston. And I went to the Red Sox game, and <laughs> I went to the meeting too. First team, first. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> Anybody from Boston, you know, it's like an illness, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're from Brazil, then it's a different illness. Okay, right. <laughs> I like more than jazz students. Right? <laughs> so, now we have a great time. The, the, la the, the, the lab gang, is they're a lot of fun, and we do. You know, what strikes me is that you're the principal investigator. I mean, I see you in those terms, I guess. So, <clears throat> you know, your job has to be to, like, focus this. Because it's easy to make lots of uh, ask a lot of questions and get a lot of answers that don't really bear on the central mm -hmm. thing, whatever it is. But then sometimes it's like that amoeba again. There's something going off, and you know Matt's coming up with something. Whoa, we got to look at that, and so the whole right. Am I right? Absolutely. This is what happens. Absolutely. And as a principal investigator, you're always looking to either keep it on focus or change the focus so that it's going down a really interesting track. Yeah. Yep. And, so and it's, it's a, it's, sometimes it's, it may take a while to figure out exactly what, which way to, to go, what to pursue. So, so here's a kind of funny story. We, have, we were studying another splenoprotein a couple of years ago, and we predicted based on what was in the scientific literature and some, some, a, little bit about what, a little of what we knew about the protein, that disrupting this protein was going to result in a neurological phenotype. And so the student who was in the lab at the time did a lot of these water maze tests and various other assays. And what she found was it, it seemed that the mice didn't try to find the maze. They just floated. They just, you put them in the water and they just float. They, they wouldn't really swim. smart. And we thought, <laughs> are they stupid or lazy? Well, it turned out after they got to be, and so these, these mice are maybe eight to 12 weeks old. After they got to be about 20 weeks old, we started realizing they were getting fatter. And it turned out they weren't stupid. They were couch potatoes. Yeah. They were and, just, and they I don't have float, to swim. Can I can float. float. No problem. And it, it, and it wasn't really noticeable in, in terms of their body mass until, until they got much older. And then we're like, okay, it's not neurological. It's metabolic. Okay, so that you learned that it's not um, neurological, it's metabolic, <coughs> and that's, a, that's an aha moment. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? You get somebody that has an endocrine background involved. And you just happened to uh, luck out that Lucia came back to, to Hawaii right about that time. So the team, the team comes in and out of these things, and you find something, and then you draw somebody else in, and they go down that path, and after a while, this sounds very exciting. It is. Yeah. So, I mean, where is it all going to go? I mean, I'm only, I'm, I ask you, you know, whether they're little people. <laughs> and I ask you whether this has relevance to the human condition. Um, don't, don't you think of those things as you oh, work absolutely. with Oh, absolutely. You know? Sure. And so, are you going to take it to that step or is somebody else going to take it to that step? No, we're trying to take it to that step. I mean, it involves collaborations with other investigators who, you know, some of whom may be doing studies in people. Yeah. But, um, but these are, you know, rules of physics almost. I mean... They're, they're in, in, in immutable rules of the way life works. And if you can find a rule that applies to both mice and people, wow. Sure, <laughs> <You know>? absolutely. <laughs> That's what it, so is that what drives you? 
what drives you? You oh. put a lot of time and effort into this. And, uh, I think the, the excitement of learning new things is probably what drives most scientists. Okay, what about publishing and all that? Are you guys publishing? Sure. Where? Journal Nature. Journal no. Science. No, I haven't published in Nature in a while. <coughs> haven't okay. published in Science in a while. But you know, these guys are publishing in, in good journals and constantly you know, working on the next paper and the next grant application. Both Lucia and Matt have, have got independent funding for their work. Great. So, so it's, like, it's like a rhythm, isn't it? You know, you're, you're working, you're applying for another grant, you're publishing. It's like those three things. It's all those things. Keep on much. going and going and going. Some play Building in there. Building your career well, that way. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you know when you really made it? <laughs> you publish the science, you get an R1. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you get an R1. <laughs> no, I think, I think what's really important is, is that you enjoy what you're doing. And I know that these guys do. You know, they're excited about you know every new result, and well, that's so, that's more important than making it good for in you. other I ways. I agree with that absolutely. You're absolutely right. I remember uh, it was the same time, roughly, when you and I met that uh, I uh, interviewed a guy by the name of Robert Olson, who who uh, built the new Fitzsimmons in Colorado, which was a tripler-like hospital that the mm -hmm. Army re retired. And uh, his job was to bring big pharma researchers into this hospital. And he did. He did a brilliant job. And they came from all over the country and set up their research. Lots of different companies. It was, it was industrial research mm -hmm. in all areas of pharma. <clears throat> and I said to him, well, how did you get them to come? What did, you, what did you do to make it so attractive to bring all these national researchers into one place that had no background in the area? And he said, it was the food. <laughs> <laughs> We, we did a regular breakfast meeting a couple times a week, and all the researchers got together and they shared their notes. They, they shared their experiences and their learning and their, those little aha moments, and they all loved it. You know, they weren't worried about you know, intellectual property, anything like that. They just wanted to have the, the scientific experience together. So when you talk about the team, you know, it's more than just finding the next step. It's the experience of finding the next step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So what's in the future? Depends what the data tells us. That's so it's iterative. It's you don't plan the next move until you find something. Well, some world. of it, some of it, you can sort of interpret what you have and and make an educated guess. And sometimes, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're not. If you knew what the answers were going to be, there'd be no point in doing the experiments, right? If you're wrong, you exclude that possibility. <laughs> so there's a lesson there. Yeah. <laughs> what about you yeah. guys? What do you see? Your careers, how are they going to go? I really would like to keep going on science because uh, no change. Profession. What you're doing now yeah. is what you want to continue to do. Yeah, yeah. Lucy is doing doing some other things though. Tell them a little bit about yeah. your blog. I I am mm -hmm. an uh, active blogger, uh, and I I'm very uh, active also on social media. So I try to communicate to the lay audience about you know. Uh, issues in science. Uh, my latest post, for example, was about Ebola virus. Uh, Ooh. All, you know, Ooh. trying. Although it's not what I research, it's not my expertise, but I try to gather the information that is possible and, and available, and a little bit more reliable, and could so the the lay audience could uh, understand in a way that they can understand and you know have a. a a good conversation about it. What was your conclusion about Ebola? I think it's it worrisome. Selenium? Who knows? <laughs> you know, it's an infectious disease, but uh, so the immune system is involved, and we know that selenium affects the immune responses. So Ooh. that's Ooh, another high moment. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's. It, can be. It's worrisome right now because it's uh, escalating to a level that it's uh, not ex was not expected. But uh, yeah, yeah this will be a real test of the whole establishment yeah. and the FDA, for that matter. You know, trying to get these things out and right. in the in the community. What about you, Matt? What's uh, what's your future look like? How do you feel about you know your career at this moment? Where's it going? Well, um, I'm kind of focused on selenium in the brain right now. The stuff that I've been looking at primarily is selenium seems to be really important for this class of interneurons called parvalbulin interneurons, which 
are extremely susceptible to oxidative stress and have been implicated in human disease and epilepsy and schizophrenia. So I'm very interested to see, to kind of go further and to see the interaction between selenium and these inner neurons and how it could potentially tie into to human disease. Great, God, that could keep you up at night. It's wonderful <laughs> to have all these ideas and questions. Well, let's uh, let's let you close, Marlon. What what do you want to tell the people about? Uh, you know, whether they should get into science, whether they should study this kind of thing or something related. What would you tell them? Well, it's a it's a tough time in terms of funding. Science funding. Um, and there, we're training a lot of science scientists, and there are questions about whether we're training too many. But um, things go in cycles, and you know we've been on a so, somewhat of a downward trend in terms of funding and 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 the job trajectory. And I think it, you know I think it'll turn around. I think if, if it excites you, if it's your passion, you know you should pr pursue it, and um, and um, you'll you'll enjoy what you do. It's the real deal. It's yep. the it's the interface with the yep. physical world. You gotta you gotta love you gotta make your job your play. Yeah. You gotta Amen love what to you that. do. Marla Berry, Ph.D., uh, professor and uh, chair of the Cell and Molecular uh, Biology Department at JAPSM. Uh, Lucy Asio, Ph.D., uh, junior researcher. Matt Pitts, assistant researcher, all there at JAPSM. We're talking about research. Excuse me. <laughs> research at UH Manoa, and specifically um, gender difference in mice and all the things that flow out of that. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.